you cannot hand it to the mainstream media for always supporting the most reprehensible of prior government officials. Let's talk about John Brennan and his recent uh, complaints about having his security access removed. The question is, does he have grounds to sue? Is it really unconstitutional what President Trump did to remove his security access? And is Brennan a great guy who is just being terribly maligned? Let's find out. I am Demarcus. Jesus is my king. You are my family. So this is recent, uh, August 20th. Uh, Trump dared John Brennan to sue because his clearance was revoked. I hope John Brennan, the worst CIA... <laughs> this is great. This is great. Uh, I hope John Brennan, the worst direct CIA director in our country's history, brings a lawsuit. It will then be very easy to get all his records, texts, emails, and documents to show not only the poor job he did, but how he was involved with the Russia probe. He won't sue. Anymore, it's hard to say uh, whether he will sue or not. Uh, we've seen some really unbelievable times recently in the news. Trump is also very smart at you know throwing out comments that really show, that make people start thinking amidst all the lies of the mainstream media. He says, everybody wants to keep their security clearance. It's worth great prestige and big dollars, even board seats. And that is why certain people are coming forward to protect Brennan. Trump said in another tweet Monday, it certainly isn't because of the good job he did. <laughs> He's a political hack. You know, Brennan's response is, if my clearances and my reputation are being pulled through the mud now, if that's the price we're going to pay to prevent Donald Trump from doing this against other people, to me it's a small price to pay. So I'm going to do whatever I can personally to try and prevent these abuses in the future. And if it means going to court, I will do that. One upstanding guy. So upstanding um, that back when he joined up with the CIA, he actually worried about a recent vote he had made. Uh, John Brennan on Thursday recalled being asked a standard question for a top security clearance at his early CIA lie detector test. I froze, Brennan said. This was back in 1980, and I thought back to the a previous election where I voted, and I voted for the Communist Party candidate. Now, this is a feel-good story from our uh, friends at CNN, uh, basically championing that how awesome it is that this guy um, who voted for the Communist Party in a prior election was still voted was still allowed in to the CIA. And I see that differently. I mean, this is... How many people get into this, these positions in the CIA? This is an ex supposed to be an extreme vetting process. And you can vote for someone, be allied to an ideology that is counter to the American ideals. Um, so it seems like we had a problem going a long time ago in the CIA. Even before Trump did this, others have come out against Brennan and called him out for the kind of scoundrel he really has been. So in this editorial, this person says, in a strange attack on my criticism of former CIA Director John Brennan's lack of veracity, um, Ron Ranish alleges that I have engaged in a sort of conspiracy theory about the deep state. He quotes me in an article largely devoted to Jerome Cozy's new book, um, which I have not read and whom I have never met. In truth, what I wrote about John Brennan's lying was not predicated on any Trump tweet or conspiracy theory, but simply based on the factual record. In 2011, Brennan, then the country's chief counterterrorism advisor, had sworn to Congress that scores of drone strikes abroad had not killed a single non-combatant. At a time when both the president and the CIA were both receiving numerous reports of civilian, civilian collateral deaths. In 2014, Brennan, now a CIA director, relied emphatically that the CIA had not illegally accessed the computers of U.S. Senate staffers who were then exploring a CIA role in torturing detainees. Brennan, in May 2017, as an ex-CIA director, again, almost certainly did not tell the truth to Congress when he testified in answer to Representative Trey Gowdy's, Gowdy's questions that he neither knew uh, who had commissioned the Steele dossier on President Trump, nor had the CIA relied on the contents for any action. 
Yet both the National Security, uh, the retired National Security Agency Director Michael Rogers and the former National Director of National Intelligence James Clapper have conceded that the dossier did play a part. Beyond that, our current National Security Advisor John Bolton came out and basically said that uh, Brennan may have misused classified information. Um, and that the unprecedented links, leaks from the administration may prompt broader charges on how security clearances are handled. But it's interesting because the same article that talks about Brennan defending himself and saying, oh, he's a great guy and he shouldn't have his clearances revoked, um, is being defended by some people like Navy Admiral Mike Mullen, um, and uh, who basically used this example. It immediately brings back the whole concept of the enemies list. And even before that, in the early 50s, the McCarthy area, where the administration starts putting together lists of individuals that don't agree with them, and that historically, obviously, has proven incredibly problematic for the country. A retired Navy admiral came to his defense um, and who oversaw the uh, Osama bin Laden uh, raid, and he called Trump's moves McCarthy area tactics. So I just think these are funny uh, equations to make here, and a funny equivalency is to make, saying that this is like McCarthyism. Yet McCarthyism was about trying to rout out communist agents who had infiltrated America at various levels. And here Brennan has admitted to voting for someone from the Communist Party. And you know, there's even viewpoints, you know, taking a quick step aside on this. Um, Senator Joe McCarthy wasn't totally wrong. History is written by the victors, as they always say. And McCarthy didn't win in his fight. Um, and like this person says in the commentary here, well, there's no question that McCarthy was a grandstanding bully. This black and white picture is not entirely accurate. Uh, the witch hunt uh, obscures the fact that, unlike witchcraft, Communist infiltration and espionage in the United States were real phenomena. Based on documents made available after the collapse of the Soviet Union, U.S. Library of Congress historian John Earl Haynes concluded that of the 159 people identified as sub subversives on lists cited by McCarthy, nine had almost definitely aided in Soviet espionage, and many others could be considered security risks for various reasons. Wikipedia, we have an interesting uh, factoid here. The blacklist begins. The hearings open with appearances by Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan. Amazing the funny things that you find when you actually start reading about things, right? Um, then president of the Screen Actors Guild. Disney testified that the threat of communists in the film industry was a serious one and named specific people who had worked for him as probable communists. Reagan testified that a small clique within his union was using communist-like tactics in attempting to steer union policy. Getting back to the nuts and bolts here, is there any truth to the claim that Brennan has a right to sue because he should retain his security clearance? And what are security clearances and why do some former officials still have them? I think it's an interesting thing because I think most of us that work in the real world know that if we get fired from a company or we voluntarily leave a company, it's probably that evening or the next day that our security access to that company is gone, that our IDs and our personal information is wiped from the hard drives um, so that we can no longer access that company. So why would we, why would, do we do this um, to allow security access to people who are no longer employed with the government? And it's ex extremely high levels. Uh, so the clearances are given to people who have underground, uh, undergone a background check and whose personal and professional history firmly indicates loyalty to the United States, strength of character, trustworthiness, honesty, reliability, discretion, and sound judgment, according to an executive order pertaining to access to classified information. There are different levels of security clearances. Federal agencies can determine how to ensure access to classified information is clearly consistent within the interests of national security, according to the executive order. Why do former officials still have security clearances? Because, just because an official has left the federal government doesn't mean their access is automatically revoked. In many cases, clearances remain automatically active for up to several years. Former national security 
uh, Council staffer Elliot Abrams said he and others continued to keep their security clearances even after the Bush administration for at least a year because the incoming Obama White House thought that in the early months of a new administration we might have some useful insights to impart information about how past events had developed or impressions of top people and foreign governments. And our successors wanted to be able to discuss classified information with us and elicit our views. Now, this is entirely not the case with Brennan. Brennan is antagonistic and has been all along to Donald Trump. So why would they ever seek his guidance or information? John Brennan's security access is purely for his own benefit, his own financial benefit, as we saw earlier with the concept of being able to be hired into certain boards and and to uh, go on tours, uh, telling secret, in, you're telling uh, their knowledge, the selling their knowledge of of how things work. Getting back to the whole uh, claim, though, that there's some sort of legal grounds that John Brennan or anyone else has to get their security clearances reinstated when the President of the United States himself revokes that clearance. Um, it's very interesting to hear to see these people do this and they say, it would set up a serious class of constitutional questions. Attorney Bradley Moss. An individual does have the ability to appeal both in person and in writing when a security clearance is denied or revoked by the respective agency according to an executive order. However, an agency head can determine that an appeal process cannot take place without damaging the national security interests of the United States by revealing classified information, the executive order states. But the revocation of Brennan's security clearances came from Trump, not a current agency head, which Moss argues there is no precedent for. Prior to Trump's decision, Moss said, is anyone's guess how the courts would construe the issue? Is it really that involved a constitutional question let's take a look those who have seen some of my other videos on this channel know that this is maybe one of my favorite playbooks do a search against the Constitution of the United States look for anything that defines security or clearances you will not find any references to those words in article 2 section 2 the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion, in writing, of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of the respective offices, and he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. He shall have the power with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States, whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper, and the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The President has the power to create all officers to appoint all officers under under his uh, domain under under the uh, executive power of the Constitution of the United States so that means hiring firing removing access asking questions he has that ultimate power over executive officers that includes the CIA that includes retired CIA administrators and you'll note they keep referring to the executive order that uh, grants these uh, security privileges, right, or defines how they are managed. And this is from the Federal Register, which logs the um, executive orders issued by all the presidents. And it goes through definitions, uh, goes through, you know, what the employees are, goes through access, and so forth. And this is all a bunch of well and good but boring things for our discussion here. I think the better question to ask is where do executive orders come from? Because they also are not listed in the Constitution at all. This was a creation, a fabrication, something out of George Washington's imagination. Now, does it go that, yes, the Constitution implies he has this power to make these orders? 
Certainly. Does it say that an executive order issued by George Washington must be followed by Donald Trump 200 plus years later? It's long been my claim that if I was president ever, the first thing I would do on day one after taking the oath is write an executive order that rescinds every other executive order ever made. Now, I would have a list prepared of executive orders I want to retain, but that would be a new executive order issued by me. Because this is exactly what George Washington actually cautioned people upon in his farewell address that the principles of precedent were dangerous to the welfare of a free society, that which we had just created. This is from George Washington's farewell address, and he actually says, Towards the preservation of your government and the permanency of your present happy state is requisite. Not only that, you steadily discountenance irregular oppositions to its acknowledged authority, but that you also resist with care the spirit of innovation upon its principles, however specious the pretext. If, in the opinion of the people, the dist distribution or modification of the constitutional, po constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an, an amendment in the way the Constitution designates. But let there be no change by usurpation for though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. The precedent must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. So what George Washington essentially is saying there is kind of tragically humorous because he created a precedent in the use of executive orders, standing decisions by the executive branch, the President of the United States, that are passed on from one presidency to another all the way to the current time. And as we've seen with Obama, it was a drastic use of these executive powers that greatly changed the moral character of this country. Trump has overturned a lot of that by issuing his own executive orders. But if we look at the executive orders, and this is just an easier list on Wikipedia, we could go to the Federal Register and get a similar uh, listing. But we can see how total executive orders started with eight with Washington. A lot of people just used one or two. But then we got to Ulysses uh, Grant, and it was 217. Theodore Roosevelt, over 1,000. FDR, 3,728 executive orders. And again, to the modern times, it's roughly uh, 300, 400 on average. So these are executive decrees. These are non-laws. The Constitution puts the legislative power into the Congress, not the executive branch. So this video wasn't really meant to talk all about executive orders and how evil they may be or how wrong they may be, but it is, my intent here is to say that you can't say, oh, an executive order is the reason why John Brennan should keep his uh, clearance, um, that there's some constitutional crisis because the president himself revokes that clearance. No, that is Donald Trump, the president of the United States, that is his prerogative and that is a constitutional, completely constitutional power. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel. Catch me on these alternate media sources.